Hey there, welcome to the Game Artist Podcast. My name is Ryan Kingsline. I am the founder of the Game Art Institute, where we train artists for the career of their lives. In this podcast, we interview amazing game artists to see what makes them tick and see how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. All right, so uh, I think we should just get started. We're early. Let's start early, and then everybody will feel like, hey, I didn't show up early, and that means I'm late. That'll be the life okay. lesson. That's cool. Were you <laughs> waiting for a long time just then? Were you, were, you, were you just sitting there just going like, where's this guy gone? <laughs> I'm no. really sorry. No, not at is all. It? No, no. I popped in like 10 seconds before I before I even heard you talk. It's all good. Oh, okay. Okay, that's cool. So, so I literally popped out for like a minute. Cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick, man, thank you so much for joining me. First, number one, um, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's late there, right? Uh, no, it's okay. It's uh, it's it's 7 p.m. here, um, okay. which which is fine. So I'm used to working late, so it's all good. All right. Well, um, I saw you do some black magic online. What the heck is going on with this hand-painted normal map thing? That's, yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, yeah. maybe should should we share your screen? Let's have a look. I've got um, I've got some stuff up on the screen. I've been playing okay. around with it, uh, so I can sort of show you. Let's have a look. Okay, so we'll good. do a share. We'll do a share. I've got some stuff pre-made and things here. What? Okay, great. And uh, so we're here uh, for those who are watching it live. We're actually looking at wait, we're looking at photo. Oh, we're looking at three D Photoshop. Am I right? No, That's right. Yeah. Looking... Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, good. We got a grid. I was like, we're looking at Maya. No, not Maya. What? All right, talk to me. What is this all about? Well, the thing is, it's kind of, I have was experimenting last year with a yeah. couple of things where yeah. um, I had a, um, I was playing around with an, uh, a palette so I find it really difficult to judge color. And so I was playing around with a palette which was based on a sphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just, I, I went and looked at a few photos, trying to create realistic skin. And I thought, well, because I, I mainly work in 3D or I started working in 3D for when I started out sort of 20 years ago or so. Yeah. And I thought, well, if I if I create a 3D sphere, which has all of the lighting on it, and I'd seen this kind of technique in a couple of places, uh, which is like a, 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 a like a mac cap kind of thing like mm -hmm. you were using zbrush yeah and i thought if i create one of those and then i can color pick from it and then it's a lot easier i don't have to do any kind of blending or anything like that i can just color right. pick and um so if if i want to light a color i just judge the angle uh so if i just think right if i've got a sphere let's open up something here i think i've got this one here so if it was like a normal okay so if we treat these like spheres and one one of these spheres here is sticking out. One of them is sticking in. So one is convex, yeah. and one is concave. I'm pretty sure I got that the right way around. Um, what I was doing originally was I was I was kind of if I I got a uh, if I had a metal sphere, and if I wanted to create something metallic, I would get a metal sphere like this, and I just color pick from it. So if I wanted to pick a cube, make a cube or something. I'd color pick from say the top part of the cube would be around about here. I'd color pick there. Yeah. If I had a cube from the side, I'd, uh, if I wanted a side angle, I'd color pick here. So it's yeah. going to be a bit easier if I plug in some bits and pieces and start painting, and I'll show you how that works. But this, it, this it is just just, this is just like MatCap. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, it's ex exactly the same. Yeah. Um, and the reason I was doing it initially was just to to get color picking, and then a friend of mine just said. Um, he was saying, "Well, why don't you use why don't you use uh, normals? Because uh, I was trying some relying. I was yeah. I was recording what I was doing initially in Photoshop. So I was recording every single brush stroke, mm -hmm. and so that I could then drop in another mat cap, and it would color pick from that one. Yeah. So it's kind of and he was saying, "Well, why don't you just use uh, normals? So I tried I tried the normal method, and it and it just worked. And it was kind of weird because I, I did a, a picture of Frederick Douglass." Um, I called him Franklin Douglas on Twitter, which was terrible. I got his name <laughs> wrong. I did that thing where you Google stuff, you know, and I, I thought before I send this, I'll make sure I get his name right because this guy's really, really important. I put in Franklin Douglas 
And I looked at all these pictures and all these pictures of Frederick Douglass came up and I was like, I must be correct. But I didn't see the bit underneath that says, did you mean Frederick Douglass? So I sent this out. I mean, most people didn't notice, but one or two people quite rightly called me out on it and said, <laughs> that is not what he's called. So it's just really embarrassing. But I sent that out on Twitter. Yeah. And showed how I did it. And normally I get one or two responses on Twitter, people, a couple of likes. And it just 24 hours later, just the Twitter feed was just was just going crazy. Loads of likes and stuff. And you could see it going round from, it started in Japan first. Mm. A few people in Japan saw it. They started sharing it and retweeting. And then eventually it went round to China and then you could just see it going round the globe. And then by the morning, it was like loads of French people with, with, tweet, with like retweeting it. So suddenly I was like, oh my God, this is like, I've obviously got something here. People are really interested. Um, but yeah, so, so it's been a, it's been an interesting one. One or two people have tried it. Um, and some others have occasionally I get people saying quite rightly, like, why, why don't you just build that in 3d? Um, and, but I can go into the reasons why I do it in a sec. What I'm going to do is plug something in that I had unplugged previously to download something. So I should be back in like 10 seconds. Yeah. So yeah, what I normally do is I treat these as, as spheres. So like I was just mm -hmm. saying. We've got the con convex sphere, which is sticking out, concave, which is sticking in. Um, and what I do is I'm just imagining the angle that I'm looking at on the sphere, and I color mm -hmm. pick. So this is the top of the sphere here. And if I'm going to create a, like a, a simple cube, and I'm, let's say I'm looking down on the cube, I'll create a base for it here so I can just show, show you a line drawing for it. So yeah. the thing that I'm imagining is going to be a cube from the sort of top angle. Okay, so it's around about here. Whoops. Okay. Okay. So if we've got a, a, a basic sphere here. Mm -hmm. Some of the shortcuts for Photoshop have changed. Mm. So, mm. Uh, yeah, it's catching me out a little bit here. It's okay. I can usually draw. It's not. Uh, it's, it's... <laughs> what I did was uh, basically I installed a new graphics card about two weeks ago, which I was really uh, pleased with. It. Yeah. And then it's like, ah, oh, okay, a load of stuff doesn't work. Okay, so we've got a cube here. So I'm imagining these surfaces what are the angle of these surfaces on on this cube well this top surface here is is roughly akin to to this kind of angle mm -hmm. on the normal sphere hmm. okay so if i was going to paint that i would just paint it in here like this so in fact i'll just fill that okay i'm just gonna edit and then fill Okay. Um, and then the side, well, we're kind of looking, it's just around about this color. That's about that area of the cube there. Mm -hmm. So we just color pick from there. Uh, so we go slightly like facing one. down, not facing up. Yeah. Slightly, slightly facing down. And we're taking into account the angle at which I'm looking at the sphere. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's have a look. Edit and fill. No, let's try it. Um, and then again, on the other side, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're just going to do the same thing. So, um, so look. and we look at it from that side. And I just from about, about there, that's the kind of angle I'm looking at for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and we'll just fill this. So, if this is our cube, you can see that the way we kind of think of it is if you've, you've generally got a, a green yellow light that's coming from the top, a bluish, slightly purplish light that's coming from, from the bottom left and a purpley light that's coming from the bottom right. So this, the when you start painting it, it's kind of weird because people look at it initially and I'm used to doing 
uh, procedurally generated normal maps. Like, like I would never normally hand paint these. I would normally just do them procedurally like everybody else does. Right. And there are, you know, the, the feedback I got from a couple of people was, um, yeah, you know, they used to do this. There's a few games companies that do this for like their 2D stuff. Right. It's just a quicker to, to hand paint these normal maps. Yeah. Um, but the way to think of it is is as if it's lit using this lighting system. And you get used to it as you start painting. You get used to kind of thinking whether something's at the right angle or not. So if I uh, if I take away these black lines and I'll just save a copy of this. Uh, let's have a look. Because I'll bring this in here uh, as a normal map. So mm -hmm. we can try it just to show you how this works. So, so we'll do a normal test and then what we're going to do is I'm just going to move this down here for a second. So in my layers, just go create a blank layer and I'm going to make sure I'm in the 3d workspace and in this 3d tab here, I'm just going to just join it onto here. I can just create a, uh, what it calls a 3D postcard, which is mm -hmm. taking the, the the dimensions of the canvas that you're in, and it's creating an entirely new 3D layer from this. And that's what I'll do. So I'm just going to create that. Uh, would you like to? Uh, let's have it, just make sure. Yeah, it's going to be a blank one. That's fine. I go into 3D. What it does is it creates your 3D space here. This is a, a 3D face, and I'm going to. It's also got the the that's the mesh there. And this is the texture uh, mm -hmm. layer four. So let's just try this out. Okay. So if we have a look in here, this is your texture. If people aren't used to this um, from uh, from working 2D, then with textures you normally get a diffuse. I've got a, a diffuse here, and in fact it's just grey. I'm just gonna. I just leave that in. So that's just a base color. Specular, we're not going to play around with just for the time being. That's like how shiny it is. I know most people are going to know that, but uh, I've worked with some amazing concept artists who just work in Photoshop. They never do anything in 3D. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is just like complete gobbledygook to them. They have no idea how this works. Um, so, and they, they don't know because they've never needed to. They just hand paint everything. So, you know, that's as speculative as how shiny it is, illumination, how, how bright. Uh, and we don't usually play around with ambience either. What we do change is uh, opacity. It always puts in uh, an opacity texture, which makes it completely see-through. So when people first start doing this, often they'll, they'll put in, they'll start loading their textures in. They won't see anything. Uh, it's because when you create a postcard, especially if it's from a blank layer, it just makes something that's entirely see-through. So it doesn't matter what you've created. You can put in all the normal maps and lights you want. You're just not going to see anything because it's it's been said as being completely see-through. Um, and the most important thing is in the normals, we're going to load in the normal texture. This is our test. I'm just going to bring this in here. And again, we won't see anything um, until we go to, uh, let's have a look at our layers and 3D, um, until we start putting some lights in. So in the 3D tab, you'll have your environment, which will have a, a load of other stuff in it. Um, it'll have IBL, which is image-based lighting. We can put in HDR maps in here uh, where we can light the scene from an HDR image. Again, this is where the crossover comes in. If you've worked in 3D, um, you'll know what these things are, but mm -hmm. many, many people just work in 2D and they're like, what is image-based lighting? It's pretty simple. It's just an image that lights your scene, but it has way more levels of lighting than a standard image. So white is not just um, full white. It is really, really, really bright. You can make it as hot as the sun if you want, and it'll really burn things out. So it means with image-based lighting, you can light things so they, they look real. You know, this is, I remember like 20 years ago when image-based lighting really started mm. to become mainstream. Yeah. Um, it became an amazing thing. You know, like, oh my word, you know, you've got these amazing reflections. It's great for stuff like that. For this, just to make it a little bit simpler, I'm going to turn the image-based lighting off. Now you can see it's gone black because there's no lighting in there at all. The image-based lighting was just a white kind of uh, overall light that was lighting the entire thing. Mm -hmm. But if I go into the, the light bulb, I can see that I can create a new infinite light, which is what I'll do. And there you can see it pops up. Now, what I've got here is just, it's a light that is shining, obviously infinitely, 
um, and I'm just changing the angle at which it hits this plane. So this is a, a plane that we're looking at. Um, we're just looking at the front of this plane. Yeah. You can see that we've got a ground plane here. So it's just basically looking at like a, a big billboard. This is my normal map that I just painted on. So you can see that when I start turning this infinite light round, when it hits this side of the sphere where I color pick from, that's where it's getting lit. Uh, mm -hmm. on that side as I swing it round, you can see I, I color picked from this bottom left hand corner um, and in fact I can show you more easily if I can just uh, turn that on and off so as I turn this layer off which is my 3d layer you can see I color picked this blue from down here so yeah when I turn this back on and this infinite light hits that blue it's lighting up and uh, same from the top as well so if I turn that on it hits the top there so so that's that's a basic principle of it um that's yeah. so why don't we talk for a second about why right is this is this because it's there or what's what do you what do you see as the applications well yeah one one it's there it's kind of like i try i try and do a few different things so I, um i was interested to see how far i could take it and see what uh -huh. it could do right and i've had plenty of people quite rightly come back on linkedin uh, on Twitter, on YouTube, and just go, why? Uh, there's a Russian guy, <laughs> he got in touch, and uh, he, drew, he drew a picture for me, and he said, uh, in Russia, we have a saying that uh, with, uh, I don't know, I think it's with paper and bread, I can make a, a metro tram, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, and this is like, and I was like, wow, <laughs> this is good. And he said, you know, but why? So why would you do this? And I was like, he drew me a whole picture and I was like, that's amazing. Thank you very much. But he was really trying to make this point. Like, this is pointless. Like, this is a lot of energy for something that's really pointless. And, uh, and I was like, and it, and it was another Russian guy that also said the same thing. He was like, you know, he, was a, he did a lot of photogrammetry. He was like, oh, you can do this in 3D. And it's totally true. You can. You can do this so much faster. If in ZBrush, you can do a lot of things where you can, well, actually I debate, there's a couple of things you may not be able to do faster in ZBrush. And I know as a ZBrush artist will be like, no, we can do everything really fast because yes, right. you know, we do ZBrush. <laughs> um, the, the point of this is is I've worked with concept artists for, I worked at Atom Hawk in, in the UK, in Newcastle, mm -hmm. uh, with these concept artists who are amazing. Just, and they're amazing because they hammer away at Photoshop and painter and they they practice day in day out and what i was not i guess surprised now you know they're way better artists than i am um but they don't touch 3d or very rarely touch 3d it's more common now you know as the newer ones were starting to come in and maybe now you know over the last few years they'll probably work a lot more in zbrush yeah um the the ones that have exclusively worked in 2d they they just didn't know anything about 3D, how it worked or, or any of those things. And the result of that was that you, if they wanted to build something and relight stuff, they would come to me and say, um, I need you to block out a, th a scene. We've got a street scene. Uh, it needs to be lit in a particular way. You need to, I need these buildings built now. I can paint these, but you know what? If you build them and you build them in 3D, you, and light them for me how long will that take and I, I would just put a few blocks in put some image-based lighting on put in the default settings for sun and sky and i could render that out in an hour with like even less like 20 minutes if it was just really blocky and they would just paint over the top of that but they for them to do that would have taken them like three four five hours so they would often come to me with with these you know and say like can you just do a block in 3d or just i can then just paint over it it'll just save time if you're doing concept work and if you're doing like a street scene and it just, and you may need adjustments for it. Very often clients come back and they say, can you change the lighting here? And you're like, I need the lighting to come from the Southeast, not from the Northwest and stuff like that. To hand paint that is going to take a long time. The other thing is that the key thing is, um, you know, what's the purpose of this image? Okay, so say I've got an environment image here, which I, mm. I did some stuff on. Uh, and this is what I was working on. Now, I, I blocked in a couple of things. Um, what have I got here? Final comp, turn this off. Let's have a look. Yeah, so I mean, I did the lighting and stuff in this and uh, I made some, uh, some in, in, like made the this, uh, um, 
it, it looked like lightning got some environment um let's have a look i'm sure i've got this i can switch it turn this off yeah yeah so i did a couple of things and change the lighting on this let's see if we can switch another couple of things on oh anyway it's somewhere and in there. is that uh, uh is that um completely like just 3d lit from the normal yeah. map yeah yeah so this is there's no shadowing i added the shadow later but the shadow is mm -hmm. pretty quick to do mm -hmm. but it means that what i was able to do was i was able to take the uh it's like the diffuse so this is the diffuse uh i, I put the diffuse in really really quickly mm -hmm. and um i just mashed it together with a load of photos um and then create a specular because i can you know with the specular uh layer i can make like the lamppost shiny i can make yeah. the this tram thing shiny and yeah. the bricks and stuff can be like matte and then uh, i can create the normal map so i can create some lighting for it as well that was i think to do the entire thing and i've got it on my um i've got it on my page here somewhere where did it go i've got some of these in here yeah, so um, when I put this in, it took about four hours to do the whole thing from scratch, but I could change the lighting on on it really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. It was really, really fast to turn it around. And particularly with concept art, it's quite handy because you're not like, when we look at, say, if you were to build a street scene, okay, so if you look at these arches and stuff like that, which I've painted in, I, I copied yeah. and pasted parts of the sphere in they don't need to be like as precise as 3d and this is the key thing they don't need to be super precise they don't need to be beautifully built you can see it's really rough like when we go into the details here these are roughly oh, wow. botched in. just strokes just really just hammer the strokes in you can get away yeah. with a lot um but and so it, there's a point at which you can paint it and you can see even that there's a couple of places where it doesn't even meet the floor um but yeah. kind of you can get away with quite a bit um say up here you've got these strokes that are just going in this was like for i think i just copied and pasted a prison uh in there so in the diffuse this was just like a, a low res picture of a prison and they just uh -huh. painted over it really really quickly if you're not going to see it in any high level of detail and it's just uh, it is just a concept and it is just a basic uh, yeah. image that you put in together really fast but you want to relight it then this is a faster way of doing it than 3d can i can i see the like the how you apply the light to this yeah yeah this would be a good one to do actually so uh let's have a look i think i've got this in one of my folders uh let's have a look I'll go normals yeah so in here we've got uh, these three. I'm yes. going to create a new one from scratch because this this image gets a little bit heavy. So so this is the this is the the base image here. Mm -hmm. um, this is the normal just mashed together. You can see it's pretty ugly in places because it is just like a load of photos. It's like Belfast Town Hall put together with some like potteries and stuff. Mm -hmm. So if I then just create um, let's have a look a new blank layer going to 3D create the postcard, uh, switch to 3D workspace. Uh, just bring this out here. And if I go into 3D, now you can see I've got my texture, I've got my mesh. The mesh you don't really see, you can see I'm highlighting it here, but yeah. there's my and there's my material. I'm gonna take away the opacity, so I'll remove that one. Now I'm gonna load in, um, I'm going to load this in as this diffuse in just separately so you can see the diffuse that comes in. So this diffuse doesn't look any different at the moment because there's no lighting on it. Yeah. Um, so you can see the two layers, diffuse is in there applied to a, a flat surface. And then I just had the background, which is the same picture. Mm -hmm. um, if I put in the normals, load the normals in like this, just pop that in. Nothing's going to happen because they don't have any lighting in. And if I go into 3D, I'm just going to put in an infinite light like this one. And that's my infinite light. So you see something's happening there. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to the environment, I'm just going to turn off image based light for a second. And then it starts to look a little better if I just turn off shadows as well. So there you can see you're sort of getting it's getting a little bit more with where we can light it really really quickly and change the angle of the lighting quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, it means also if we create a new point light 
yeah, the point lights start to get quite handy. So if I just move this point light around, I can start shifting this in to here. You do get some stripes on it. You've got to turn the shadows off. And is this point light um, working within a 2D space or? This is in a 3D space. So if I pull it right out, you can see it lights everything up. And mm -hmm. then if I push it, and I push it right far back, eventually it just stops lighting it because it cuts straight through the, yeah. it cuts straight through the polys. Um, but I can also limit it so we can make it as, uh, let's have a look. I can change it to, let's have a look. Uh, I don't want it to be, I want to have a light fall off in there. Let's just check. Okay, let's just move this. Okay, so the light fall off is pretty big there. Just change that inner fall off. So this is just controlling how much, how far the light radiates mm -hmm. there. So they've got a, the sort of maximum inner radiation, radiation uh, is coming in and then outer. And then I can move this around within the scene as well. So I can mm. shift that. I think at the moment it's cut. There we go. Okay, so I'm just popping that out there. So I can start shifting this around. So you can see if I had a light, which was in front of the bridge there, um, you know, I could put a light in and it, and it hits the reflection of, of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it um, hits the front of the tram. I can also add in, if I go into the mesh and the texture, I can add in the shine so I can put in some, uh, let's just play around with the specular actually. So this is going to give an idea of how shiny stuff is. Bing. So you can see mm -hmm. the, the tram suddenly becomes really, really shiny. Uh, I can control that. So if I go into here and just turn the shine down or, or make it more sort of pointed, here we go. So that's a little bit better. So you can see that tram, um, when I move this light around, that tram is like super shiny because I mm. deliberately made that like a lighter gray color. Um, and the other bits are sort of are not shining up so much. The track should be quite light. I made the tracks a much lighter, uh, grayer color, but I can shift that up. So you can see, shift that around. So you can see particularly with the tunnel there or with this, uh, with this bridge, as I move that around, you can see that it's sort of, it's, as it turns the corner, we've got quite a hard edge on that. I'm, I'm lighting this, the, the, the street, if you like, or the, the, um, the, the platform then I just have to shift the light a little bit and then it's lighting the inside of the uh, of the bridge so it's pretty quick I can just create basically a whole bunch of these lights and and change the the direction and and, um, and how luminous they are as well so I change that around so yeah basically it means that we can change the whole lighting setup of the of the whole scene just really really fast mm -hmm. and we can put things in there and you saw initially like how rough those um those brush strokes are but say particularly up here with this um this prison bit here and but when i turn that light around let's have a look let's see if i can catch some light on there i'm just going to turn the color up that's no, not going to do it let's have a look yeah there do you see it was catching the windows yep. on the inside Yep. So even though those are just brush strokes, they were really, really rough. It's enough. It's enough to to be able to give me some um, we, to give me some uh, option to give me some variation in the lighting just with a few clicks and shifting stuff around. Totally. Um, so and then with this lighting, one of the main things as well is I've got this cat. This is the cat. So this is a much more complicated scene. It's got hundreds of layers in and stuff and. Um, it's uh, so like there's some motion to it as well, so I just change it to motion. Uh, I did a couple of different lighting options, so I did one where the cat's really burnt out. There's there's a light set up here. I think I flattened this because it was just getting too heavy. Mm -hmm. um, there's a light, uh, an infinite light that hits the cat right head on, so he, he's really over bright. Each of these um, bits of fur is an individual brush stroke. So I just, uh, he eventually, he, he just was like a sphere as a head. Um, and I just color picked and created and just did them as individual brush strokes, but it meant I could change the lighting. So this is the, this is the other lighting that I put on. 
so it had some lighting from the back and from the side a little bit softer and so you can see just within i think once once the normal map for this was done um to relight took about sort of five minutes i did Put his ears back I quite because i've got a cat and i know that if my cat was welding something then like he put his ears back because mm -hmm. <laughs> he's loud um and so it just means that i was able to like really really quickly put it together and then just get the effect of this cat welding because mm -hmm. you know i can just change the lighting on it shadows and stuff it's not going to do dynamic shadows unless you put real three objects in there the shadows are there just painted in um but again it, it doesn't take too long to do it and um yeah, so that that was the main main thing. So the main purpose of it really is is trying to concept things quickly to give yourself some some ability to amend things really really fast yeah. um, and just amend the lighting uh, without having to a learn 3D because a lot of people they'll you know if you if you've been a 2D artist for a long time and you used to Photoshop then opening up Maya or Blender or something i mean blender's free there's a lot of software that's free but it's not free in terms of your time so yeah. people are going to spend if i had to like sometimes i have to relearn these things or if i learn a new piece of software um you know you're talking like two or three days and if you're a concept artist who mainly works in 2d 95 percent of the time but you know which is the, the truth for so many because that's you know why they're so skilled they've really really honed that skill in their 2d package mm -hmm. you just don't have time um to to learn it and then forget it like because you don't use it for six or seven months and then maybe go back to it and go oh, how do i how do i build a cube again i can't remember how to do this right um, or how so do i so rotate so as they change yeah, yeah. the navigation <laughs> This is oh it. So, so very often, if you if you're not used to working in 3D, it just you 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 end up having to relearn these things a lot. Mm -hmm. So it is, so I, it's that's part of the reason. Whereas in terms of you know yeah, it's complicated to get your head around initially, but the number of steps you need in order to be able to create lighting really really quickly and create some variation is relatively few. It's like five or six buttons to click. I mean, I even forgot like a couple of days ago i was going through and just checking how to do this again and i totally forgot a couple of the steps and but i just watched the video and i was like oh yeah you just do this this and this and and then it's there and it's you're, you're able to light it um so that's the main reason why it's not a replacement for 3d there's a lot of people who've put in messages quite rightly saying oh, i can build this faster in 3d or i can build this this would look better if you built it in 3d but um but in terms of you could build the raw 3D fast enough, but I would question whether you could also texture and light it and this, get the specular um, fast enough, as fast as this, um, because what you would end up doing if you did it in 3D would probably be something really beautifully detailed and realistic, but that maybe is not what is required. You know, for concepts, totally. very often you don't need it really really sharp and realistic you you want to be able to paint over it you want to make adjustments to it and especially if you do want to adjust say if if somebody comes back and says you know i, I don't like this prison up here i want to change it for a cathedral yeah, you're going to build a cathedral <laughs> you know you can't, yeah. you, you can't you just hey just get a picture of um you know westminster abbey stick it in there just paint it over for for like 25 minutes and and there you are it's it's a you know it's a, a lightable uh, structure and it just it does just what's required to be able to see what it should look like um so yeah that's the main reason why is i hope that's does that does that explain it i've done a lot of rambling as i've been i don't <laughs> i don't do a lot of <laughs> i don't do a lot of talking as at the same time as painting so yeah. or sort of filling around in photoshop but does that make sense or uh, yeah would i you, mean you know, i i get it yeah you know i uh, you, you know as well as i do i mean people who know 3d are going to look and be like uh eh, you know i could do that in three well sure but that's not the point you know so yeah. you know the, this is it's just cool and uh, you said that this is something it went viral and it was on art station art station went nuts um as far as i could tell so yeah you know, I was telling the group while you stepped away, I was like, it's important to kind of remember because we all get focused on achievement, right? Which is really interesting because we started this as your artists and artists like chaos and, but yet we have to pull together 
a, a portfolio and it has to be awesome. And, you know, we have to make sure that we know the best thing on substance and painter. And then we got to, there's all these things that we have to do. We're very achievement focused. And this just looks like fun. It's a lot easier. I mean, it, this is the thing. It's it's from because I worked in management for 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 quite a long time, and I still mm -hmm. do bits of management. So from from my point of view, um, when I see say when I see people having to to learn stuff quickly, and if you're in an office where you've got a new project coming in and you've got particular a particular skill set that people need to get trained up with quickly, um, sometimes you're looking for solutions that are are pretty fast and very often if you if you do a new project which has a new style to it or a, you or new skills are required you've got to be so careful about saying well i'm going to get those artists to start using um you know this particular software and this particular method uh because you've then when you schedule it as everything is scheduled as you'll well know you'll say, okay, we're going to get these artists to do these concepts over, mm -hmm. you know, the next 25 days. Okay. So, but very often what you'll get is um, uh, you might get, okay, we've got a street scene and it's like Paris in 1850 and we need you to paint it for, you know, four different times of day. Um, and so all the time you'll be thinking, okay, well, the smartest thing to that to do normally would be to do a 3D block out for that. Then we just light it four different times. This could probably be quicker than doing that. So you'll often, and it also means you're not dependent on getting a 2D person to work on it who may not know 3D and then having to get a 3D person to do the block out for it. So you're talking about less people as well. So mm. you've got fewer steps. So you can say, okay, here's a video. Can you watch that? Does that make sense to you? Can you make mm -hmm. it work? Okay, great. So you, you're you might well get some productivity, some result within four or five hours out of one person rather than having to get two different people in and having to get them to 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 um, to do sort of one doing a three block out, one painting over the top. And quite often with concept art studios, um, sometimes isn't it, you know, there isn't a 3D person that's there. So they have to go outside of the studio uh, and that can have its own complications as well. Um, so it's, yeah, it's... Uh, you know, so it's 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 a fun thing to do, but hopefully it's useful. And it's but maybe it's the way it's the way I often calculate stuff because I work in I've, I've always worked in 3D, well mainly worked in 3D. Um, so it, it makes sense to me, but I know there's a few people that would look at it and that's not the way they think. They you know they think in, a, in an entirely different way, mm -hmm. which is you know which is totally fine. That's everybody you know everyone gets good results at the end of the day. Uh, but this particular system works okay for me. Cool. Uh, and I think Tobias is, uh, he brings up a good point there in the comments where he's saying this is actually a very powerful process that can be applied to set extension, compositing, and black magic fusion, you know, in different um, applications, Nuke, you know, and whatnot. So you've got, you can use the color to do more than just light here. Like, like in Photoshop, you can do the same thing, just making masks. Yeah, totally. I mean, this is the thing. It's, it, I've had a couple of people from, there's a couple from Wata, um, uh, MPC as well, yeah. um, and um, Lucasfilm as well on LinkedIn, and it was just nice because I put it on LinkedIn. I got a lot of feedback from that, mm -hmm. um, and they they fed back and said this is useful. I can use this, which was really really nice to hear, because up until that point I was thinking, well, people might well do what the the guy did with a loaf of bread and the and the wire and just go mm -hmm. what's the point in this but actually people are coming back and say yeah i could i could genuinely use this this could be useful well you know that i think really i mean it speaks to one of the big things big reasons i wanted to talk to you which is that as artists we you know we're, we go out into a dark wood and we're alone for a lot of the journey and we're not guaranteed that we're going to bring back you know the bacon we're not gonna we're gonna bring back goods for people and like this must have been a like this journey as you're going through this people are you know somebody writes a big diagram that you basically are building a train with bread and and paper um but then you're you know you're sticking with it and you're trying you're experimenting you're showing and you, you know you're still in it and i still want to look at this um um franklin douglas test oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i want to look at go. the frederick one here in a sec but like, who gave you permission to just explore? 
you know, and, and to, and, you know, not to try to make this like fully functional for somebody. Does that question make sense? Yeah, it's, it comes with the luxury of time. That's the yeah. thing. <clears throat> you, you, when you work in a studio, you don't get time. Yeah. Um, when you're, especially when you're younger and you're just starting out with stuff, I've seen a lot of new artists who will come along and they want to develop skills. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a real difference between I'm old now. So I'm like, <clears throat> sorry, I'm about 44. Mm. I am, I am 44. Um, and the, the difference between myself and a, a younger artist uh, is that the younger artists have got a lot to prove. You'll see them staying late and they'll work hard and they'll use their own time to develop their skills. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when they get very often, they, they're full of ambition and they, the time they very often, they don't want a lot of money. They just want to get better, which is right. really amazing. You get these artists who come in, um, you know, young people and they'll, you, it doesn't matter what salary they're on. They just want to do cool stuff. Uh, I think as you get older, you're kind of, you've got different priorities. You've got family, you're wanting to, you have to get the mortgage paid every month and all the rest. So, um, your priority is a little bit different. Um, so it's been, I've been quite lucky just recently where my time has been changing around. I was doing different, different pieces of work and stuff. And I got some downtime for like three or four weeks and just to pick up something that I'd started a year ago where I was just like, let's just try this out let's go back to like it used to be 20 years ago when I just wanted to try stuff out for fun and see where it would go. And having that two weeks, you know, it's sometimes you feel so lucky if you've got just two weeks to, to or even a few days to just work on something and see where it goes. Mm -hmm. And this is the first two weeks, this when I started working with Frederick Douglass, this is the first two weeks that I'd had in sort of like, I think five or six years, to actually just experiment where I, I could sit down instead of having to do it in the evening in front of the TV uh, on the sofa and trying stuff out where I could just sit down and go, I'm just going to try this all day and see where mm -hmm. this goes. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to try it tomorrow. You know, so it's quite, but uh, that doesn't come along very often, you know, you, but usually you've got to get the money and you've got, you know, you've got plenty of stuff to do. So you, you can't just kind of navel gaze for too long. But fortunately um, I just had the time to work on this which was really nice. Mm. Um, so, and also f the other thing with me is that I tend to, um, I'm a jack of all trades. So I do a whole load of different stuff. I'm not amazing at doing any particular one thing. I just do a lot of, I just do like bits of 3d. I can animate rig 3d, 2d cartoon realistic. There's not one particular thing that I'm great at, but I do like to explore loads of different things. Um, and in a career that has sometimes meant that I'm the one that's still being employed <laughs> because I remember somebody once were a place I worked, this guy, we'd had a few beers, there'd been a couple of redundancies and everyone's like, oh, this is, you know, everyone's looking over their shoulder going, am I, am I going to be the one next? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I thought I was totally safe. I was like, yeah. You know, especially when you're younger, you're like, I'm a genius. I'm always going to be here. You know, <laughs> this is, this is going to be great. And then I remember this guy coming up to me. He's a really, really nice manager. And he just had a couple of beers. And he said, oh, Nick, you are so close to being made redundant. I was like, really? Like, it was, it was a real shock. And he said, but, you know, but you know too many different things so that if you leave, like we can't do the rigging, we can't do like fixed characters and we can't do this, that and the other. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the kind of like, we kept you cause you're amazing. They just said, we kept you cause if, if you go, we're in trouble cause you know too many bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, so the way I've tended to, to get along over the last few years is, is just knowing a lot of different stuff and just, um, you know, and being useful and being able to say, yeah, I can do rigging. I can do, you know, the 3D, the 2D uh, and learn new things. So it's that sort of jack of all trades thing. Really. Hmm. You know, that's, that's so, it's uh, it's timely advice, you know, but in today's industry, and I know that there's a lot of striations, like there's a lot of uh, variation in what I'm going to ask next, but um, doesn't the industry seem to be becoming more specialized? 
or not in your opinion what, what do you think is going on there yeah it's definitely more specialized in in 1999 uh you could it was you didn't even i think you just needed to know the software and you didn't even need to sometimes be from a particularly artistic background it was more software based because people didn't have the opportunity to use the software um and because games were made by fewer people um and they were predominantly two well there's like 3d games but they would i worked on 2d games and there'd be small teams of people you know um whereas nowadays the games are so big so they're they're massive massive um you know it's a massive production that those i think nowadays as a generalist i think maybe it would be harder because if you're if you've got thousands of people working on a game or hundreds of people working on a game each one of them you know if, if you're the person that that if there's uh, there's somebody i heard of who worked in uh, worked on racing games mm. and they would just did the best tarmac you know or the, you call it asphalt uh they 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 just were good at asphalt they could do it um and and you know make all sort of different road surfaces and they were brilliant they were just really good at that um and it's the same i think with concept artists now um very often it's kind of going the way of films film production film production there's a small kind of kernel of people that run the film production itself and then they'll hire in different um different studios different groups of people to do specific jobs for a fixed period of time and then those people will go go away again so it could be props people bring the props people in for uh, to make the props for so many months and then they'll finish and now they'll move on to another film. And I think games is going in that direction more and more. Um, it's been doing that for a long time mm. where it's games production is so big that, that yeah, those roles are becoming much more specific. Um, so I think one of the things that where I worked at Atom Hawk was when you spoke to studios, they would very often say, you know, we, you know, wouldn't be a massive studio, but we can't afford to have concept artists full time unless it's mm -hmm. a really, really big studio, uh, because if they're working on one game over like three years or something, that pre-production process is only going to last for a few months. And then, you know, what are the concept artists going to do? Because unless they've got another game to work on. So that's where the specialism has really started to come in, where people will work on something for a set period of time and then move on to another, another gig with maybe another company, uh, certainly in concept art. Uh, that's the case but i think it's it's certainly more i think that's that's where it's going is more um specialized it's worked okay for me as a as a manager because you can talk to people and know what it is that they're doing and that's useful because it it's if you're you know if you go up to somebody and you don't know what they do uh if they're a 3d artist and you they can very quickly work out you don't know what you're talking about if you've never used 3d mm -hmm. you know you you can't you can't pretend or blag your way through this um conversation if you don't know what they're doing um but if you do then you can talk on their level in terms of what what it is they're trying to do you can give them suggestions about how to work or if they're doing the 2d stuff or working in photoshop and it, it helps enormously if you've been a, if you're a manager that has been an artist and you've worked in out and, and done a whole load of different things then you've got much more credibility than if you just come from kind of management school right. so that's where being a generalist has worked well for me and it, it's you know for for some people that that works well as a path but yeah i think you're right it's it's it is getting really specialized but it's tough you know it's a it's a tough market to be in definitely um, and that specialization always... doesn't mean more stability is is what i'm hearing from you right um it's kind of uh i think it's yeah maybe maybe if it's it's it it's really tough it's you've either you've either when i've seen artists get work mm -hmm. very often it's because they do one thing they start by doing one thing really well mm -hmm. so that's where they get the attention um so uh where i've where i've reviewed portfolios a few times uh to to hire people mm -hmm. and i've gone through you know i've help to hire maybe 30 40 people and gone through portfolios and stuff and the advice i normally give is um is to say well when you're looking at a portfolio it sounds cruel but you're actually looking at what they've done wrong 
more than what they've done right mm -hmm. so you're kind of looking for the worst piece of art mm. you you can there's there's the best piece which will catch their eye immediately which is where you're like oh that is outstanding that's that's the that's the you know when you look at a portfolio put right. your best piece of work up first and you'll that catches people's eye and they'll look through and then i think what i tended to do is go through and just check what what are the problems here you know if even if it's outstanding where isn't quite right just because you know that when you're working with that person you need to be prepared for what they may have problems with not because you're trying to be nasty it's just you you want to put them on the right work you want to make sure that they're not going to get um they're not going to get demoralized by being put on something that they're finding really difficult you know if they're mm -hmm. a character artist um and they find environments difficult then the whole kind of confidence may be around character art and it's you can crush somebody's confidence by giving them work that they find difficult to do uh, and within months they can really start to question or weeks they can start to question their own ability uh which is um which is really tough for an artist they can really have a hard time with that so you're looking through portfolios and you're kind of going okay they can do these things really well that's what caught my eye now we're looking for the things that they haven't spotted that they don't do quite so well and is, is it is it such a problem that this could be difficult if we hire them or is this something that they can work on and get better at hmm. um so so yeah going back to specializing specializing is if you specialize and you specialize in your portfolio and do amazing characters that's going to catch people's eye um but it's also useful to be able to say and i can do these things in a small studio definitely if you go into a small place they're going to expect you to be able to cover a whole different bunch of roles in a bigger place um if you're working for a big big dev studio then they'll probably just want you to do the one thing that you do really well so it's going to depend on who you're who you're um you know who you're applying to uh but it's it's always useful just to just test different areas so, you know maybe if you've done characters for a long time try out environments just just see you know see that see where that goes and see if you can get that kind of level up hmm yeah that makes that makes sense there's a lot of questions i got there um i think one of them that i want to start out with is um what uh, let's start with this one what do you look for when you're looking at a candidate so you mentioned you know you're looking at reviews you're looking at something that catches your attention and then it shifts and you're starting to look for the chinks in the armor right what the problems and, and all of that but um what is it that you're looking for in that piece that attracts your attention and the 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 kind of um the context behind this is one of the things i tell the students a lot is we work from a strength focused approach where it's like, you know, everybody's going to have weaknesses. I don't, for me, I, I don't think it's essential that you master anatomy because I spent my life doing that and I'm far from it. Um, but what is important is what are the triggers that people, uh, that make people think you're a job candidate? What are the triggers that make people think you're not a job candidate? Right. And so what I'm asking is, is what are the things that you look for, um, in work? And by that, I mean, like, can you kind of, pull out um suss out some of the triggers the things like high poly low poly like what is it that you're paying attention to does that make sense yeah yeah i think um uh, it's, everybody has their own individual things that they look for mm -hmm. uh, i think i think the attention to detail is is really important mm. is um i did anatomy is is good it depends on what you it depends on what the artist is is mm -hmm. really you know what kind of job that they're aiming for yeah um if they're i think there's it's kind of tricky depending it depends on what they're going for if it was a concept artist i think um if they're going for environments say it will be i'd be looking for stuff that i know is difficult or can be really tricky to do mm -hmm. so if it was a, if it was a piece of concept art um you get a lot of stuff with high contrast high contrast is relatively easy to do but it's, you know it's, it's not always easy it's, it's difficult this composition all the rest of it to do but um it's really interesting when people try and do images that are um maybe more subtle low contrast mm -hmm. not strong lighting maybe really subtle lighting maybe it mm -hmm. could be sort of slightly foggy day maybe there's reflections on the ground and you're looking for things that you know that people would find really really difficult to do um doing sort of 
lots of kind of fire and high contrast stuff uh, with lots of red and things where, they, where it's, it can be kind of slightly f formulaic where you're getting all these warm and cold colors and blending them together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's, that can be simpler to do. So it, it, that's for concept art. I think it's trying to find people that, that are able just to create um, uh, images where, you know, there's, there's subtle tones, the there's, there's subtleties, it can be the key to that. There's, um, there's an artist called uh, Raphael Lubke, uh, who, who we hired a, a while back. Mm -hmm. um, he, he does beautiful paintings. He really works on, on you know, he, he'd be able to paint um, the sky. A lot of the artists, they're able to do that um, as well, they, but he sort of sticks in my memory. And he would paint clouds and it'd be like, you know, everybody can kind of paint clouds, if you know what I mean. It's, it can be, you can copy a picture of clouds and, and there they are. But there was ways in which he would do it, the way that he would play with a color that would just really make it pop. And he'd be like, oh, that's so good. That's so good. And I don't know why it's so good. That That's the kind of thing that really gets under my skin. I'm like, oh, I wish I could do that. <laughs> I could wish I could work out why that thing just totally pops. But he can make relatively simple images um and really make them really uh you know stand out and I, I really like that in terms of um i think in terms of uh environment and characters i think environment um it's uh, i'm just trying to think of of some games i've seen recently I, again it's uh, i'm thinking of the more kind of subtle ones where people are looking uh you know, where it's not necessarily like super dramatic, they can just make something just really pop without, you know, without making things like totally overstated. Um, and that sort of attention to detail. And I think for characters, I do like anatomy. I, I have a thing about fingers, uh, where like the first thing I look at in the silhouette of a character when it's drawn is the fingers, because there's such a tiny element of the character itself. But, um, the way that your fingers curl when they're resting uh, is there's a particular look to it so that the, the like sometimes the, the little finger or the pinky finger can can be sort of slightly curled in or can be slightly straight um, that the angle of the thumbs there's such complicated things hands um, to, to draw and they have so many different gestures and there's such a but there's such a small part of the 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 character that they can get really easily overlooked and one of the first places I look with characters is just the fingers if I can see those because if somebody cares about the placement of the fingers and the way that they're curved you know that they've they've cared about everything else on that mm. character um so that's that's one of my little bugbears is like when fingers kind of get lost and forgotten and, it, and you're kind of thinking did they did they do that because they find that difficult or because they were in a hurry um so yeah i i always think of the fingers first and look at those if if it's all generally in proportion it looks okay then i just focus on the fingers like what what have they done with those what you know did they care and you can sketch them in pretty quickly as well fingers can be like a few lines but you know, um, there's a big difference between the, the kind of realistic placement and just having a bunch of like sausages sticking out of, of a hand, if you know what I mean. Totally. In fact, that's perfect because that's a, that's a perfect example of a trigger that tells you pro or not pro. You know, like, is this something you're struggling with? You know, which I mean, you know, you could still get a job, but it definitely tells me where you are, you know, on, yeah. on the conversation. And I, I do the same thing. I look at knees, like knees and elbows. Like if those are jacked up, it's like, I know right where you are. It's everything's right there. Yeah. Um, but hands, that's a great suggestion. Cause you can tell from like, do they catch the little flip up um, of, of the tip, you know, depending on how the fingers are. So mm -hmm. uh, now with that done and said, are there any areas that you think an artist and, you know, character environment doesn't matter um, that an artist wanting to work in 3d games, film, advertising, whatever, is there an area that they can focus on um, that might be kind of like one of the power centers that really, you know, help them get jobs, help them, um, you know, quit that, that night restocking job at Costco that I had, um, I think, you know, I think um, at the, the, one of the, the most useful things that I've seen, the, the ones where I've seen people like graduate from courses and things that they've, 
yeah. that they um, and go straight into companies. Often it's the 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 technical roles. Unfortunately, the 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 kind of easier jobs to get into are the ones that people don't necessarily want to get into. Mm -hmm. or people find harder um it goes back to the thing about they like back in the bar you know being told like we'd have laid you off but you know too many ways of doing stuff and um it's it's like that so the the simplest um or one of the most direct routes is to go into a lot of technical detail that people aren't interested in doing maybe some scripting um, being able to mix um, some artwork with something a little bit technical, something procedural, learning some some scripting so that um, that people sometimes don't want to go into mm -hmm. in a company because they because everyone wants to do the cool stuff. Um, then that, that can often be something where people say, oh, yeah, actually a scripter, if you're able to do a little bit of scripting here, that could be really, really useful or um, uh, so so knowing your your technical stuff is is really really helpful and just be able to show that um so that you can then help everybody in the studio with with their kind of techniques of doing of, of doing stuff mm -hmm. uh, if you if you know the sort of really really heavily technical stuff uh, i've done that with rigging uh in the past where i was quite happy of whenever anybody sort of said do you want to learn how to do this i've always kind of gone yeah yeah that's fine i'll take the manuals and i'll learn how to do it so i, I learned rigging pretty early on and and rigging is how i've managed to get a lot of freelance jobs where people have gone like we don't, we don't have anybody that rigs can you rig this way um so premium you can do the technical stuff is really really important um i think with recently i went for a job and i put in for one where because a lot of my stuff's quite cartoony um and they they came back it's a really nice guy just replied but uh, but said you know your stuff is just too cartoony you, you know we need people who can do seriously realistic stuff um so i think getting up a, a level of realism that that is just um you know has um you know so they, it's so good now i mean shaders is, i mean i open marmoset uh, about a year ago, it's like getting, it's like a Christmas all over again. Like this suddenly in May, I was like, oh, I bought Marmoset and it's got these shaders in that just create shade, like the skin that I tried to create with like hundreds of shaders in mm -hmm. Mental Ray about 10 years ago would take two days. Suddenly like Marmoset, you just do it in like 25 minutes and it's just mm -hmm. so lovely. But really using those kind of shaders to the best of, of your ability and really getting into those details. Um, but also, um having if you if you're going to create characters really kind of um you know the, you add something to don't necessarily take a theme like an orc or something and do a similar orc to what other people do try and take a different t different viewpoint on it try and yeah. create something that's original so it's, it's very much you know when you get commissioned to do things you're you're given you give them what they wanted but better than they expected. That's what you always try and do as an artist and you get hired to do stuff or if you're, you're in work, it's like, this is what you this is what you wanted. I'm giving you this character that we designed and made, but it's better than you expected because I've come at it from a slightly different angle or I've, I've you know, um, so, and, and do your research as well. Um, so uh, having a knowledge of, of art history is really, really helpful and applying that is really good. Uh, do you, I don't know if you remember June, uh, the, it was a Frank, was it Frank Herbert um, novels? It was like 1980s, Dune? Sting yeah. was in it. Dune, that's right, yeah. And um, and uh, just the backgrounds of, of that are just so beautiful. Like the environments are so incredible, like the Harkonnens and the, and the House of Atreides and things. Mm. And the House of Atreides, designs that comes from like 19 1900s russia turn of, turn of the 20th century russia uh where it was kind of a mixture of like arc art nouveau mixed with this russian style somebody had really mm. gone into the into their art history books and really done some research uh and applied it and came up with this beautiful looking environment so incredible um so if you're able to 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 look around and really do your research and apply that to your work um just to do something that's a little bit more original than what the than what other people are doing you know just just to have a different take on stuff that's really going to stand out 
um, and that's that's definitely going to help as well. Um, but uh, yeah, and I, and I always go back to anatomy and stuff. How did you find anatomy? Because you were saying you've studied it for a long time, and you've you, you'll have got to a standard, I'm guessing, which is phenomenal. Have you always found that that's as useful as everyone says, or are you kind of like you know, do you have your own sort of take on that? Or well, it's in, it's interesting because anatomy. Like anatomy for me uh, today is actually one of – it's one of the things that's going to be potentially impacted by future tech. So it's like number one, anatomy is um, a process. Like it takes a while. You have to change your brain and – you know, it's all about learning and, and learning little bits. Like I remember one of the stories I tell my students is that um, I'd studied anatomy for years. I went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. I'd done figure drawing since I was like, you know, a kid. I took my first art class when I was like six years old. And, um, you know, I, I've been drawing, I've been sculpting, I've been doing all of that stuff for a super, super long time. And um, when I first, one of the first classes I uh, brought, so I, when I, I started ZBrush workshops a long time ago, and um, I just did ZBrush classes, and then I started to bring some of my friends in, and I brought Chris Costa in, uh, who's just an amazing human being, and um, I have him teaching a class, and he's sculpting this caveman guy, so it's probably on his art station, I think, and um, he's, he's sculpting this caveman guy, and I'm looking at this caveman guy's rib cage, and I'm like, Chris screwed up, right? I mean, like, the rib the rib ends underneath the pectoralis. That was my, like, even though I had been drawing, I had it all, I had this assumption inside that the rib cage kind of ended a little bit below the rib cage or below the pectoralis. And, um, and I totally forgot about the eighth, ninth and 10th rib, <laughs> the 11th, the 12th, whatever. And, uh, and so I had all these assumptions inside my mind and it takes time, you know, cause I was sitting there, I'm like, Oh, do I tell Chris that he screwed up? And then I thought to myself, well, oh, I trust Chris. Uh, maybe it's not Chris. Maybe it's me. Maybe this. Maybe I'm missing something. So then I actually hit the books for like about a good hour, hour and a half, and I'm like, "Am I right? Is he right?" And then it was like, "Oh, I'm an idiot." You know, there's this thing. Like, I am so glad I didn't say, "Hey, Chris, you know, you kind of screwed up that sculpt." And Chris is like, "You kind of don't know anatomy, Ryan." <laughs> I see. Uh, this is it. I, th I think. The thing is, it's it's like a landscape. If you if you treat if you treat, um, you know, I grew up in in the Shropshire Hills, and yeah. so you, you get to know, <clears throat> you literally get to know the landscape, you know, where the hills are and stuff like that. Um, and it's really interesting watching people sculpt characters, and you can see exactly where where they've walked over and over again. So like, you know, maybe it's the nose or the eyes. They know that bit. They've walked mm -hmm. that landscape all mm -hmm. the time. You can see they've mm -hmm. got it down. They haven't visited the ears that much. You can, you can kind of <laughs> tell that they, they have walked around that bit, you know, and you're yeah. kind of like, and you, and for me, it's like, uh, you know, yeah, it's knees. It's, um, what's the other bits? There's there's some other bits that I always miss the you know around the the shoulder blades the muscles around the shoulder blades and things, um so it's really interesting that's that's the thing it's the time to take around the hu take the walk around the human anatomy, get familiar with the valleys and the hills and say you know and it, and it and also how it changes you know when an arm bends or a leg bends like what where do the muscles go where does the knee pop out where does um, and it takes time and, and yeah, like you say, sometimes you just forget that particular landscape and you can, you, yeah, you'll start correcting people and, and then they'll go, no, that's, that's not right. You haven't, you know, you haven't visited that area of the body recently in your mind, you've, or, you know, in the textbooks, because mm -hmm. you, you know, haven't got that right. So it's that constant sort of, um, having to, to go over stuff uh, again and again that, that you have to do. But like you say, the, um, it's getting more automated and um you know there is the question of um is it are we just gonna you know in five ten years it just like the same skin shaders where you've got all these presets uh in marmoset which i which i love it's great um are we you know we're moving more and more towards presets with mm -hmm. um you know character modeling software if you want realistic characters um so this sort of idea there was a, a talk at gdc um, it was about uh, a couple of years ago, uh, somebody from, I think it was Naughty Dog, was talking about the future of the games are over the next 
20 or the next 10 years um and just this this idea that we you know we can use photogrammetry we can use so many different things mm -hmm. uh and automated tools to be able to create our characters then there's no need to create characters or human um non-stylized realistic characters from scratch i mean there is because you need to to know that stuff you need to be able to like you know picasso if you've seen that you know you'll have seen early picasso paintings when he was 13 years old or something you could draw Oh yeah, I mean he was amazing. Yeah. I, I saw some of the stuff recently, and the, the paintings are incredible. Yeah. Um, so in the same way, it's like you need to know, you need to know the ins and outs of exactly what you're painting before or building before you go deforming it, before you go stylizing mm -hmm. it. But you know, um, but yeah, that's that big question of like, uh, you know, is, is uh, in the next ten years, is this all going to be sliders? Are we going to be, you know, or you know, in, in the at least the base characters? Um, yeah. Have so you gonna... seen? Um, have you seen the? Uh, there's a YouTube channel by a guy called. Uh, his username is Control Shift Face. Oh right, no, I need to have a look at that. Okay, and so he he's doing deep fakes, and he has this scene of. Uh, it's from The Shining, and he's got a couple of scenes from The Shining, and he morphs Jim Carrey's face over Jack Nicholson, and it is insane. Like. Oh unbelievable it is literally jim carrey with jack nicholson's voice coming out of his mouth everything's lit the expressions are unreal uh it's blows my mind and so i'm like i've got an anatomy class i've got a sculpting the face class and i'm looking at this like oh my god <laughs> what and this yeah. kind of speaks to what you're doing too because you've got like this this tech that you're doing that's like you know 10 years old and you know, still applicable, still doing other things. And we're all kind of at this moment now in history where it's like, I, you know, if, if anybody comes to me and says, I know what's going to happen in 10 years, I'm going to be like, you don't know Jack. Like nobody does. Nobody knows what's going to happen in 10 years. I, it's crazy. Yeah. No, it's totally, it's totally true. And this is it. I, I think, um, you know, we certainly know that it's, uh, you know, you're you always get the, the industry is getting bigger. There's you know more and more people are playing games. It's it's mm -hmm. becoming such a big you know it's becoming such a big industry, um, and so the skills are always going to be needed. Um, there's a big crossover as well. I think um, games engines are going to be used to do more animations because I, I for one, am sick of sitting and waiting for stuff to render mm -hmm. forever and ever, you know, and, but the, the, the frame rate that you can get off um, Unity and Unreal um, uh, uh, is, and the quality of the, 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 the draw, the quality of um, the, uh, the imagery that's coming off there, even in real time is way better than we were rendering and sitting on a render farm for like 15, years ago or something mm. and it's good enough for, for so much um so a lot of that's getting quicker so there is the idea that you are going to games artists could start moving more into animation and that whole blurring a crossover of skills i think is is certainly going to keep keep happening um so it's definitely still you know it's, it's going to be a good area to to keep going into where you will actually end up um you know I, I don't know you could you know you might have wanted to go into games and then start creating characters for a, for a, a 3d animation and vice versa so you might find yourself in different areas but that's that skill set is, is still still useful but yeah it's difficult to know what's going to happen in the next 10 years you know an interesting thing actually happened um with one of my students because there's there's always going to be the expectation of what your job is and then what the job really is right and this has happened to several of my students they they're like i'm gonna be a character artist they go in they um they get the job as a character artist at, it's at a triple a studio and they're like i'm uh, that's it i've made it and then they're they realize they're um they realize their job is managing outsourced art yeah which is not creating art no no it's it's definitely this is a thing i mean um and <clears throat> as soon as you step over the line into management uh ha having done it it's kind of it's a different it's a different ball game altogether mm -hmm. it's a totally different thing um sure you can talk to you can kind of talk the language as it were you know and speak speak the speak or whatever talk the talk um but you you you're a different kind of 
you're a different animal basically in the office compared to 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 everybody else because you've got that responsibility mm -hmm. and that can be really really tricky um and i think yeah and also yeah that's that's the other thing you've got to think quite hard about what it is you want to do if you're in that position and you you find your um you're moving more into management and you're doing less and less of the artwork and if the artwork was a thing you wanted to do then think carefully about where you're going because there's a reason why there's less managers than than artists um one because you edit you don't need that many but it's also because it is a tougher and tougher job the higher you get the more responsibility and the more stress you're going to have mm -hmm. um because you're you're dealing with people's livelihoods at the end of the day um you know so if you've got a team of 10 artists and some of them've got you know some of them've got family some of them've got responsibilities you know it's a horrible thing to ask people to to do overtime or to you know to to have these difficult conversations with people and then that's one of the reasons why people don't like going into management so you can find yourself after five years um kind of yeah sure you're climbing that ladder within the company but if it's on the management side you're going to do less and less art you're going to be more you're going to be dealing with excel more than you are with photoshop mm -hmm. um, and that's going to become more and more of a distant memory what you can happen is um you get what's called a rosebud manager which what oh, this is what i call myself this is my own terminology yeah uh, you know it's you, you hit 40 years old and you go back and you've done management for most of your career or you've done it for like two thirds and you're like oh, do you know what i just want to do the artwork that's what i always wanted to do so i've met people who've done management for sort of five ten years and done it well they're really really good but actually what they want to do is just create the artwork and they don't mind taking a pay cut and they don't mind not having the responsibility and not having kind of the status if you could call it that within the company they just want to do the thing that they wanted to do when they were seven years old which is to create artwork show it to people and have them go yeah that's great you know because that's yes. like a win you know it's a win every yes. couple of days um yeah. So, and there certainly is an artist when you when you create artwork, you'll get a pat on the back every couple of days. You know, you've got a chance. You know, pretty. You know, every couple of a couple of times a week to show stuff to people and have them say, "Yeah, that is awesome. I love it." Whereas a manager, what you're doing is you're um, you, if you're doing it well, you're making people in your team feel that it was them that created the success because it was they did the work mm -hmm. uh and you shouldn't really be the one who's kind of standing up all the time just going yeah i'm ace i managed to get this done you yeah know, you shouldn't really make your team feel like that they did that um and as a manager you're there to deliver what people expected <laughs> you know it's like we, we hired you to do a game well then you finished you know that's and and not screw that up somewhere along the way mm. um so you're, you're not going to get that every couple of days people looking over your shoulder and looking at your work going oh i love that that's great yeah um, nobody comes so, to the manager and says great job managing me yeah <laughs> it's usually no, the opposite does that. <laughs> yeah that's it other managers you might get a you might get a look of like a nod every yeah. now and again people <laughs> go yeah 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 nice call but yeah. um you've really got to be congratulating yourself yeah. uh, it's usually steering things away from what could have happened you know what which was you're never the, gonna want to, you know, sorry go on what was the phrase you said a rosebud manager yeah I've, I've it's been in my head for a long time a rosebud manager you know like um citizen kane yeah i was just uh, wondering if it was hitchcock <laughs> yeah it's like at the end it's like you know i've never seen the first, i've only ever seen the end of the film but it's it's like going back to what it was in the first place you know uh -huh. that's all I, all, that's all i want is uh is to do that and i think you do get i'm a bit of a rosebud manager uh i can't help tinkering with stuff um mm -hmm. and often that's not a good thing when you're supposed to be looking at the spreadsheets and what everyone's meant to be doing and oh. you're fiddling around in photoshop and you're oh like no no you 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 get other people to do that um but yeah i think that's a real you know i think there's a lot of people put their hand up and say you know actually you know cut my salary in half i'll just go back to doing the 3d stuff because that's what i enjoy doing i i i just discovered i'm a rosebud entrepreneur <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah 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 i remember when i when i quit my last job last job i ever had um and the man the guy the the owner was like i didn't know you wanted to be a manager and i'm like i don't want to be a manager i just don't want to work for your crazy ass and um 
and then later on, like, I think it was a year later, I was like, oh my God, that's what this guy was talking about. <laughs> like spreadsheets. Like this morning I woke up, I'm looking at spreadsheets, you know, and uh, that, that is not my happy spot. It's, yeah. um, but you know, at the same time, it's like, I don't, I don't make student happy spots at all if I'm not doing my spreadsheets. Yeah. Yeah. Spreadsheets are sadly where, where the battle is won and lost. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's that thing of, um, yeah, I've done, you know, scheduling and stuff. And really the more you look into it and the more detail you go into it, the more screw ups you're going to avoid. You're going to avoid mistakes if you really look into that and drill into it. Mm. Um, and it's just having the patience to do that. But it's one of those things. I think when people start out and they, they, they may get offered work <clears throat> as like an art manager, which is what I was doing. And I enjoyed that. It was a, it was a privilege to work with some of the people that I've worked with, um, particularly at uh, Atom Hawk, the, the quality of the people there, they were good people, they were nice people, you know, from top to bottom, the way it was run. Uh, I've not worked there for five years, but uh, Ron Astiani, who who uh, who headed up the company then, um, it just ran it well, it was really sharp, and the people that worked there were just, they were just nice people. One of the things was they were nice because they were really good at what they did. Mm. There wasn't a feeling of having to put anybody else down. You know, they would just, they would have, they would compete with each other. Um, they would have competitions over lunchtime to do the best concept art along uh, on a particular theme. And mm -hmm. they were so encouraging to each other. And that was, you know, that was the most productive workplace I've, I've been in. Um, but yeah, if you, if you keep an eye on your career, so if you're doing well, you might get um, asked, you know, do you want to be a lead artist or you, do you want to, um, you know, there's this new role, you know, it's 50% management, it's 50% doing the artwork. Just keep an eye on where, on where that's going if that's not necessarily what you wanted to do. Um, it's definitely a, a way into things. If you, you know, if you, um, if you, uh, uh, you know, I get more um, uh, inquiries about work from um, from like uh, people abroad and, and companies abroad because of the management side, because there aren't as many around. Um, so, yeah, it's it's good. It's good in that way. It's well paid and it's much more secure work because it's transferable. Um, but, yeah, it's a different it's a different animal altogether. That's awesome. Thanks for the email, Cynthia. Just got it. She's saying she really enjoyed this talk because it's uh, really helping her understand not just process, but also career path. Um, cool. Yeah. And, uh, and Nick, man, thank you so much for sharing. You know, I, I know we went over time, but thank you so much. It was, I really enjoyed this conversation and learning um, and uh, just hearing about your process, about the way you think about this, um, what you've done, all that. So thank you so much. Thanks very much. It's really a pleasure. Pleasure to do it. Thanks for asking. All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Nick, do, can we go to your art station? Um, can try yeah, yeah. Uh, Just so okay. people know where to find you. Yeah, where we go. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where am I? Where am I? Here we go. This is my art station. So I've got to put a few more bits and pieces up. i got a little mech that I made. Um, there's little videos that you can show. Mm. shows the process. Yeah. So it goes up through that as well. Awesome. All right, so, guys. Yeah. Cool. There you go. All right. Take care. Thanks, Nick. Take care. Thanks very much. Cheers, man. All right. Thanks. All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This, this is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe haven't learned a bunch, but at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills 
the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview? What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're gonna be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right, thank you so much again for being here. Take care, have an amazing day.